Thank you. So, dear European friends, dear friends of uh, European cooperation, uh, dear proponents of alternative ways of European cooperation. How can European cooperation be built without the European Union, as we've been asked here? Being Norwegian is tempting to say that uh, this is a very good question. Why didn't you ask it before? Yeah. <laughs> well, most people in this audience uh, probably did. And uh, being Norwegian, <coughs> I shouldn't boast too much, although a majority of Norwegian have voted no to membership twice, both in 1972 and in 1994. We are still much more integrated in the European Union than most of us appreciate. The so-called European Economic Area, the EEA, was a trap set up by the reigning bureaucracy. These people rule according to the following principle. If the inhabitants of a nation state don't like our ideas, we keep asking them again and again and again until they surrender to exhaustion and accept them. If they are too stubborn, we just rephrase our concept in a way that makes it unnecessary to ask them again. Norway did not get the referendum about the EEA agreement as a consequence of what I just said. Still, it is no doubt a better alternative than EU membership. We do keep some of our national sovereignty but the so-called dynamics of the agreement mean that unless we are like scouts, always prepared, we lose what is left of our sovereignty bit by bit. Today's EEA agreement is much more extensive than the one our parliament accepted back in 1992. In 2012, the Euro crisis has brought Europe into a historical turning point. Either we recreate a Europe of nation states, where major policy decisions are taken by institutions elected by the people, or we give in to the bureaucracy's assault on democracy and create a totalitarian European superstate. Here, national parliaments and national <coughs> governments will be subordinated to a bureaucratic monster of unelected officers who use their powers to shape a new political and economic order. Dramatic, yes. How did we get there? And how do we get out of here? And what will be the implications of a European cooperation without the European Union? First, how did we get here? Why do we have this crisis? The answer is not just simple. It's obvious. And it's in the wallets of some of you in this audience. It's the euro itself, just as simple as that. This is why we have this crisis. A crisis that was predicted by EU skeptics as well as independent economists since before its creation. A common currency for strong economies and weak economies without a powerful regulating mechanism. That's a recipe for disaster. Still, Many leading politicians did not expect the euro crisis to come. These are very naive people. One should yes. never ask, one should never vote for such people. 
When they recommended the euro, they just repeated what other people had told them was right without reflecting upon it. Back in 1994, the Norwegian No Queen, Anne Engel Lundstein, had a very simple but still most decisive appeal to the Norwegian people. Tenk sjør, make up your own mind. Don't just trust the authorities. Listen carefully to the arguments from both sides, and then you reach a personal decision. The Norwegians follow that advice. The decision makers of the Eurozone can only regret that they did not do the same. Am I saying that nobody knew what they were doing when they created the, uh, the Euro? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. The masterminds behind the Euro knew exactly what they were doing. They have always wanted a full pol political and economic European Union, where the nation states are reduced to some sort of regional authorities. But they couldn't get it because European politicians were too afraid of their voters. Now the bureaucracy may get what they have always wanted as a result of fear arriving with the euro crisis. Do as we say or all kinds of disasters will fall upon you. That's how kings and other dictators always have got their way. In 1972, Norwegians were told that staying outside the EU would mean economic disaster with mass unemployment because we would lose our European markets without membership. We said that we had an alternative, staying out of the EU but having trade and cooperation agreements. The yes side lost in the UK and in Denmark that year, but it won in Norway. Second time, 1994, Norwegians were again threatened with lost European markets and mass unemployment if we didn't become members. Again, the yes side won in the other countries, then it was Austria, Sweden and Finland. But the no side won in Norway. In 2012, we have 3% unemployment. The average of the EU is 10 and a half. Now, however, Norway does risk to lose important European markets. Not because we are outside of the European Union, but because people in the European Union may not have the money they need to buy those products. So uh, maybe they'll be right at the end, but for a completely opposite reason. <laughs> I already said that we may be at a historical turning point with two main alternatives. One giving in to the bureaucracy's assault on democracy, and the other one recreate the Europe of nation states, <coughs> cooperating nation states. Here, a common currency will have no place. Building European cooperation without the EU may sound scary. So the, our main enemy will be the fear of the unknown. We saw it in Greece earlier this year, and more recently in the Netherlands, when these two countries had elections. People seemed for a long time to go for braver alternatives. But, in the last moment, they hesitated and voted for what they had. And we do not have a detailed, bright, shining alternative that will solve all European problems. But we have a better alternative that will develop on our way. Let's not think of it as a scary revolution. Let's rather look at it in the same way as we look 
at changes in national governments. When a national government has been sitting too long, it is time for a change. That can look scary too. And they will say, oh, the opposition will not be able to govern, only we can govern. And some people believe them because they, they hardly uh, know any alternatives. So just like a new government, keep all the existing laws until they change them in Parliament one by one. Same will go for existing European directives and laws within the Europe without the EU. I mean, they will continue to be valid until national governments have decided to change them. And in each country there will be quite a few directives that people will be quite eager to change. But it doesn't mean to, uh, that they'll have to get rid of the rest of them. I mean, it makes sense. In most cases it makes sense to have some standardization and regulations in, uh, in, in Europe. But they should be made in cooperation between elected politicians at the national levels. So, of course, just as the Norwegian alternative to EU membership and to the EEA agreement is a trade, bilateral trade and cooperation agreement that will have to be negotiated, the same should go for a Europe without the, EU, the EU. There we will have a multi lateral trade and cooperation agreement. Which includes the agreements with the EU that one would like to continue with the scope and content that may be acceptable to all countries. And where changes and cooperations are done through negotiations between countries. So, less dramatic than we very often think it is. But, I think we have to see the things will get worse in Europe before they can get better, no matter which way out of the Euro crisis that is chosen. In 1995, I was asked to contribute to a special issue of a European journal called Futures. We were asked some people from different countries to come up with a positive vision for the year 2025. And in my contribution, I wrote, the European Union will have been dissolved. <laughs> Not everybody liked that very much. 17 years have passed, 13 more years to go until 2025. I haven't changed my mind. So, um, the crisis is already here. It's created by the present, present system. So, we shouldn't be afraid of the alternative ways and imagining uh, Europe, where the Europe has been dissolved. There are different ways of doing that. And I think we should focus a bit on how to do it, because one option is the poor countries, Greece, Italy, Spain, to leave it. That will be a very expensive solution for them, because their own national currencies will be much weaker than the Euro than the euro. So their debt will grow by having to pay in their own weak currency uh, debt in the strong currency of, of euro. So it would be much better if countries like Germany, perhaps Finland, would leave it first. Because then it will be the other way around. The debt will still be in euro. 
not in the strong national currencies of countries like Germany. So it will be much better for those poor countries. So I think we should uh, get a bit discussions about things uh, like that too, although we are not in a position where we can demand <laughs> Germany to do this or that. Although a uh, quite well-known figure like Soros has done it recently. He has asked the Germans to take responsibility and leave the euro first exactly for this <laughs> reason. Thank you.